Welcome to Picks for Polls, a Chicago Bears draft podcast presented by the Bear Report and Blue Wire Pods. My name is Andrew Freeman, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Yusei Koshal. We recording this episode on a Wednesday here, February 15th, following the Super Bowl that just occurred this past weekend. And of course, that means the end of this past year of NFL football. It's, it's been a wild ride for the 2022 season. And the Super Bowl, in many ways, was a wild ride as well, which we're going to be getting into for um, a portion of this podcast and a lot of storylines based off of um, that Super Bowl. But before we get started here, you said, how are you doing today, man? Yeah, I'm doing well. You're right. It was certainly a wild, wild season all the way from the first game of the season to the last. And this season, I think, really showed us all that the NFL continues to change so much year in and year out. There are teams that we pick to represent the AFC and NFC in the Super Bowl that have a major injury like Von Miller and the Bills, and they just can't get over it. And it's, it's just more proof, I think, this year that no matter how good your roster really is on paper, they there's always going to be – you're essentially always one domino away from the roster having a major hole and the entire team taking a step back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it just goes to show that building a team is that can can be, can compete for a Super Bowl is tough. And you know, like you said, you lose one player, and obviously, losing one player shouldn't be the end all be all. But there are players in this league that are that have a much bigger impact than uh, your average player. And when you lose one of those guys, it can have, like you said, a domino effect on the rest of your roster. And you know, we're gonna be talking about storylines like that a lot in this episode because I think. Um, in many ways, this with the end of the season here, a lot of this episode has to go with, I think, reflecting on the lessons learned from this past year and how that can you know, relate to the Bears as they look to kind of turn things around going into 2023. But before we get into some of the broader storylines, I think, of uh, not only the Super Bowl here, but um, just the season as a whole that just transpired. Um, and it feels odd that we're already talking about the end of the year because it felt like it feels like almost like yesterday that we were like just talking about the very beginning of the season. It's kind of wild how quick, you know, things progress in the NFL throughout the course of a year. Um, but let's just talk about the Super Bowl game because, you know, I, I you know, the Super Bowl, it's a special day for me um, and many of my friends and family. And we always love to get together for these, you know, the big game here and um, see each other and catch up and, um, you know, I was able to see a lot of friends and family over the past weekend, you know, catching up with them to watch the game and um, just enjoy that once again with them. And it's always fun to be able to do that. And it's a good thing that we got a very good game to go with that. Like, I thought this was a very entertaining Super Bowl. And, of course, for those who weren't aware or weren't as plugged in, which, you know, what are you doing if you're not plugged into the situation here? But uh, the Kansas City Chiefs are the Super Bowl champions for the 2022-2023 season. Uh, beating the Philadelphia Eagles 38-35 in a very exciting game. It was back and forth throughout. Uh, the Eagles, it felt like, were in control for most of this game here. You know, they had a lot of long drives. They were up for most of this game. But, you know, Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs offense just woke up in the fourth quarter, as they always do. Um, they got on top late, and um, they kept that lead. And eventually, uh, with the game tied up, Getting the game-winning field goal late in the game to seal the win. There was some controversy in the end, which we'll get to in a little bit here. But first of all, you say what were your thoughts on the game as a whole, and um, you know what were, what were what were kind of the emotions that you were going through as you were going through this one? Yeah, I wouldn't really say I was going through any emotions. It's weird, you know, because this past year was my first year coaching football too, and so whenever it comes to football. Ball, there's a certain whether it's coaching or kind of going ahead and watching the game or even just being in the press box at Soldier Field. You know, there's that very stoic demeanor because I'm watching it for the genuine love of the game. But I think it's interesting because when you look at this game, it really felt like it was a tale of two halves. You had the Eagles who raced out to that 10 point lead at halftime. And again, they were absolutely cruising. But that's been the Eagles theme all season long, right? They were a team that was never really used to playing from behind. They always jumped out to a start. The handful of losses that they did have came down to the wire. And then all of a sudden you get to the Super Bowl and 
everything's going great. And it really felt like from the Eagles perspective that they took their foot off the gas when it mattered the most. That is perhaps the best roster in the NFL. Okay. They've got two legitimate wide receiver ones. They've got a really good tight end in Dallas Goddard, a three headed monster at running back led by Miles Sanders. But it felt like they underwhelmed especially in the second half. And then the Chiefs, on the other hand, like the Chiefs have a phenomenal roster. Yes, they do. But can you sit here and confidently make the argument that the Chiefs didn't have the depth at certain positions like defensive line or even wide receiver compared to some of these other teams that were in the playoffs? You can certainly make that argument. But what made the difference in this game was experience so that's experience in terms of the players on the field and that includes guys like Mahomes and Kelsey saying hey we've been here before we've been to the Super Bowl twice in the last four years this is our third time in the last four years and the Eagles you know you guys have a bunch of older vets like a Jason Kelsey a Lane Johnson a Fletcher Cox that have been here but it's been a really long time for you guys it's been six or seven years and then you top that off with Andy Reid having more experience than Nick Sirianni, who it's complicated, but Sirianni's another Andy Reid disciple. It's very clear that this was one of those games where experience coaching made all the difference in the world because where the Eagles got conservative and took their foot off the gas in the second half, the Chiefs went steamrolling over them. Yeah, I, I like the points you make about the roster. Roster is going into it being a big storyline for this game because the narrative going into this game was that the Eagles had the far superior roster than the Chiefs. But the reason why the Chiefs had a chance to win this one was because of the Mahomes factor, the fact that they had that advantage at the quarterback position. And like you said, the Eagles, you're going into this with the weapons that they have with A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard, and the stable of running backs that they had, they can kind of you know mix into, into there as well. Um, you know, having the best offensive line in football, having one of the most prolific pass rushes in football um, to go along with playmakers in the back seven. Um, I mean, it is truly one of the better rosters we've seen in the NFL in, in a few years here, just on paper. Um, and the Chiefs, like their roster is no slouch. Like, I, I don't want to make I want to make that clear. Like, you still have Holmes, obviously. You still have Kelsey, um, and you have a good offensive line with what they have there right now, it's not as good as the Eagles, but it's definitely in the conversation for a top five to 10 unit in the NFL. All things considered, they have pass rushers with Chris Jones, who, you know, he's one of the better defensive tackles in football. If not, he's, he's like right behind Aaron Donald as best defensive tackle in football. Um, and they got some guys as well in the back seven that can make plays. Not to the degree that the Eagles have though. That's kind of the point there. You know, the Chiefs have star players, but they don't have the all around collection of talent that the Eagles did. And again, like the narrative going into this was that, you know, Jalen Hurts, like the quarterback matchup, Jalen Hurts, you know, having a great season, that year three breakout that, you know, a lot of teams, a lot of people did not expect from him, um, especially as a second round pick um, guy who's improved every year of his career. But, um, you know, a lot of evaluators didn't see this coming from Jalen Hurts from a performance standpoint. So a lot of, you know, the narrative I felt like going into it was, you know, look at what this roster has done to elevate the play of Jalen Hurts to where he looks like a, you know, MVP caliber quarterback for a lot of the season. And then you get to the game and it's like the opposite happened where it felt like the Eagles roster was almost letting Jalen Hurts down. Like he was still operating with a lot of clean pockets. The offensive line did a, you know, was doing a masterful job in protection. Really the offensive lines for both sides did a really good job because of, um, you know, the field conditions just being as awful as they were when there's bad field conditions, that's an advantage for your offensive line, which uh, we don't have to get into the field conditions for too much for this one. There's a lot more detail. I think, um, for that a later time and date because uh, we're on different subjects for this one, but um, side note there, but you know, Jalen hurts though. You look at how he played other than like maybe a couple throws here and there, like he was on fire in this one. It feel like it felt like this is probably the best game he's played as a pro. He was making exceptional throws in traffic, exceptional reads, making plays outside of structure, um, you know, giving his guys chances like that one touchdown he had to AJ Brown where he just throws it up there gives AJ Brown a, a chance uh the throw he made at Dallas Goddard I forget I think it was in the second half of the game but the one where it looked like Dallas Goddard dropped it 
Um, but he, it looks like on replay, though, that he got two feet in bounds. He was able to secure it before um, he got two feet in bounds. Um, just a ridiculous throw. I think it was a third down play, too. Um, in between two defenders there, layering it over the underneath defender, but in front of the uh, deep defender to get it to Dallas Goddard. They're like, um, Jalen Hurts was – playing like a guy who um, knew he had a $50 million contract on the line and was wanting to live up to that price tag. And he certainly did. He looked like a true bona fide star franchise quarterback out there. Like the Eagles did not lose this game because of Jalen Hurts. I know he had the fumble leading to a touchdown early in the game, but there was plenty of time after that where Jalen Hurts made up for that. Um, he was a machine in this one, both with his legs and with his arm. Um, really for large portions of the game, outplayed Patrick Mahomes in a way but at the end of the day, though, you know, the reason why the Chiefs won this game was because they have a guy like Patrick Mahomes. And, um, you know, even though the statistics in terms of a volume standpoint don't really stand out for Mahomes, especially knowing what he's been capable of, you know, throwing for 300 yards a game for his career, you know, just the prolific, the prolific nature of his ability to um, destroy teams with his arm. It, you know, it really felt like Mahomes was a surgeon in this game, you know, dialing up passes underneath, getting the ball out on time, on target, um, distributing the ball to multiple receivers, involving everyone in the offense, um, converting third downs, you know, using his feet when necessary, even with the bum ankle. Like it just felt like whenever the Chiefs needed to play for Mahomes, he delivered and he was very efficient in this game. Um, just got the job done. And that's really all you can say about his performance there. Like, yeah, like it, it wasn't his greatest performance from – you know, the mind numbing number standpoint, but if you were watching the game closely and, and watching how he manipulated the Eagles defense and, you know, how he ran the offense for the chiefs, like it was a Mahomes masterpiece with the way he had, that he played on Sunday. You're right. It certainly was. And you mentioned the messed up ankle. You mentioned how he was just surgically carving up the Eagles defense. I mean, listen, that Chiefs offensive line, you have to give them credit because they were, you could argue this right now, the biggest factor as to why Kansas City was able to win the game. I understand we want to put the spotlight on Mahomes. And again, he's, that's not anything special, putting the spotlight on the start quarterback just because it's what this league has done for so many years now. But we also have to give credit to that front five up there, okay? Simply because... You have essentially this quarterback who's playing with one ankle, and anyone who's ever coached quarterbacks knows that when a quarterback's footwork cannot get set properly as a result of an ankle injury or a lower body injury, then what you're dealing with is a quarterback who can't fully rotate into his throws, can't fully rotate in his hips, can't step into his throws either. And really is kind of just lobbing the ball up there. For Patrick, though, you could see there were times where the ankle was bothering him, but he just played through it. And why was he able to dice up the defense the way he was? One, because receivers kept running. But number two, I mean, that offensive line really went ahead and gave him all the time in the world. And the flip side is also true for Jalen Hurts. I mean, there were some really clean pockets. So you can't sit here and you can't blame any of the quarterbacks for winning or losing this game. You can't give all the credit to Mahomes either. I think that there is a certain level of degree in the sense that this was probably the most team-oriented Chiefs win we've seen in a long time. For a guy like Jalen Hurts, listen, the Eagles have a number of pending free agents this offseason. There's key names there like TJ Edwards, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. Howie Roseman's going to find a way to get creative, but ultimately Jalen showed us all this year that he's capable of being a star quarterback in this league, and that should continue for the foreseeable future as long as they continue to just adapt and adjust around him. Because ultimately, for the Eagles this offseason, it's not just going to be about retaining some of those free agents. It's also going to be, we have a year film on what Jalen Hurts can play like and what he can do when he's playing at a high level. How do we adapt and adjust and add something new to the offense to ensure that defenses don't have a read on what we're doing? Yeah, absolutely. I think the Eagles, I think they're in a good spot. Like, yeah, they're 
like you said, Holly Roseby is going to get creative this offseason, I think. And, you know, their cap situation, if you look at over to cap.com, it's, it's not great with especially some of the pending free agents that they have. And we're going to get through some of those pending free agents because it's going to concern the Bears, I think, uh, looking forward to this offseason. Um, but, yeah, they're going to lose some talent here, but they're also going to be in a position to, to, I think, you know, gain more talent with the resources that they do have, especially in the draft, having two first-round picks. Like, I think they're going to be able to find ways to improve that roster and, and still maintain what they got there. Like, I, I don't know about improve the roster, but at least maintain um, at least a semblance of a quality roster that, you know, you can win with the Jalen Hurts even on a big extension. But, you know, touching back on the Chiefs real quick before we get to the final thing for this game and move on to our next topic here. Um, I, I like what you said about this being a, a team performance for the Chiefs because, you know, even though Mahomes was a surgeon in this one, he wasn't necessarily making all the spectacular throws and plays that we are normally accustomed to. A lot of it was scheme-based, and a lot of it was, you know, especially when we look at their red zone execution. I mean, guys were wide open on some of those touchdowns. So the, the touchdowns who Kadarius Tony. Um, and Sky Moore, for example, like they were both practically the same play. Um, you know, obviously the Chiefs coaching staff found something in the Eagles defense and they were able to exploit that. And cr- that created a couple of the easiest touchdowns that you'll see Mahomes throw. Um, and it just goes to just the operation of that offense in general. Like you said, like it, it goes back to their offseason strategy where they trade away Tyreek Hill and they bring in all these guys. Um, again, not a lot of you know high end talent there, but just a lot of different skill sets, a lot of guys that can contribute in a different number of ways. And you put that around a guy like Travis Kelsey, who is essentially a number one wide receiver in essence, and that still allows you to have a dynamic, um, efficient passing attack with Mahomes distributing the ball and, and able to make the plays that he can. So yeah, it just goes back to you know smart team building, and we're going to be getting into this team building because that's going to be a big uh, uh, topic for our next section here for this podcast. But before we get to that, I got to say one last thing. You say, what are your thoughts on the holding call against James Brad's birthday? Because that's kind of been the big talking point for the Super Bowl, and I think it's going to be for a long time. What, what were your thoughts on that You know, big sequence near the end? See, I am indifferent about it because if, and again, one of the hardest parts about sitting on your couch and watching the game is that they show a lot of these replays when challenges happen from one frame and one frame primarily only. You know, when you get a chance to see it from multiple different frames and angles, that's when you're like, okay, I understand why that may have been called. I thought that it was a penalty, which I understand it was a big factor, but I can understand why the ref decided to go ahead and call it as well, because there was a visible tug of the jersey. Now, part of the problem is that there is not necessarily clear or defined rules for what pass interference is anymore, simply because the game just favors the offense. I mean, it's not like James Bradbury had fully wrapped his arm around Juju Smith's hip and was totally disrupting him from running the route, but I understand why Carl Chevers and his crew decided to go ahead and call that penalty because there was, like I said, a slight tug of the jersey there. Now, what that basically proves is this, right? is that the entire refereeing system in the NFL needs a complete overhaul and revamp because there was the call earlier in the game too where the Eagles had, I believe, run a play, but then they went back and looked and said, hey, no, it's not a catch, which, again, just brings into the what is a catch versus what is not a catch. Yeah, I mean, there were some controversial calls and that and that last penalty holding call by Bradbury was certainly the biggest of them. You know, for honestly, I feel like for the most part, and I, I know this will go against the grain here, but I honestly feel like the rest for the most part got the calls right in this one. And I get it. Like, you know, the, the fan in me wanted to have a more dramatic finish at the end of that game, you know, with, you know, the Eagles and Jalen Hurts having a chance to go down there and tie or even win the game with just over a minute left to play there. But on the other side of things, like it, like you said, it was the correct call. Like, there was clearly a hold on that final play. And, you know, yeah, were they maybe like letting them play a little bit earlier in the game? And, you know, is it odd that they decided to call it, it at that situation? Maybe. But at the same time, like, you know, don't hold his jersey and, 
you're going to get off the field there because I don't think Juju is going to get open on the route and have a chance of making a play anyway. So, yeah, at the end of the day, like, it stinks that, you know, the Super Bowl kind of ended in an anticlimactic fashion, especially with how exciting the game was to that point. At the end of the day, though, I think I can't go out out of that game and saying that the the referees, you know, had a clear bias in favor of the Chiefs and that the ref and that the Chiefs won because of the referees. That just isn't the case. Like the Chiefs were the better team. They made more plays when it counted. Uh, they executed in the fourth quarter when the game was on the line. And you know, the, the simple fact of the matter is that the Eagles defense couldn't stop the Chiefs in the second half, whereas the Chiefs were able to get stops against the Eagles in the second half. And that was kind of you know, the biggest factor in the outcome of that game was that, you know, again, like the Chiefs just made more plays when the game mattered. And, you know, they capitalized on the Eagles' mistakes more than the Eagles did capitalizing on the Chiefs' mistakes. So that's kind of the last I think I want to talk, we want to kind of, kind of cover for the Super Bowl there, you know, from a game standpoint. But from a bigger picture standpoint, let's move on to our next topic here, you said, and kind of bring this full circle to the Bears here because the Bears, obviously, we all know this is a big offseason for them. And, you know, one of the ways that the Bears can maybe look forward to 2023 is kind of looking back and seeing, you know, what the Chiefs, the Eagles, the two Super Bowl teams, the two teams that they can kind of model things off of, what did they do to get to that point? You know, what lessons can be learned from both teams? And, you know, let's start the Super Bowl, Super Bowl winning team, chief, team, the Chiefs. You know, you say when you look at the way that the Chiefs put together their roster, obviously it helps to have a quarterback like Patrick Mahomes. I mean, that. That sets the table for everything, but um, you know what lessons can be learned from Kansas City and and how they built their roster to get to this point where they're the juggernaut that they are year in year out. Well, I think really the first thing you mentioned it already is it's all about having that quarterback in place, and part of that is drafting a quarterback and then developing a plan and sticking to that plan. But part of that plan people also have to understand is not just going out and being active in free agency and drafting the right playmakers. That is 25 to 30% of it. The rest of the work is done with smart coaching. Look, if you look at a lot of these teams around the NFL, Take a look at the Chiefs. Eric Miami has been the offensive coordinator since 2018 with Andy Reid. As the head coach, you look at Joe Burrow, he has had Zach Taylor and Brian Callahan as his offensive coordinator and head coach. You look at Josh Allen, too, who had Ken Dorsey as his QB coach, as well as Brian Dable as his offensive coordinator. The point I'm trying to make is that when it comes to developing a young quarterback, you need to have continuity at offensive coordinator at QB coach and at head coach. And so that's what the bears need to learn and understand because historically, when we look at the last two quarterbacks that this team invested in, I mean, Jay Cutler had what three offensive coordinators in the first four years of his career going through Mike Martz, Mike Tice. At one point you had Aaron Cromer in there as well. And then you had Adam Gase as well. So like, three or four in basically a five or six year period. And then you had Mitch Trubisky who had Dowell Loggins, then Mark Helfrich, then Bill Lazor, and pretty sure there's a name in there I'm missing. But people should understand the point by now is the fact that you need to have that quarterback in place, but then also have that structured coaching in place and more specifically that continuity to help young players develop. Yeah, and I think for the Bears, like obviously you hope that they can kind of keep what they have in place with Eberflus and uh, Getze and that offensive coaching staff, keep that, you know, intact moving forward. Like obviously I hope that Getze is the guy as an offensive coordinator moving forward. I'm still not convinced that he's the right man for the job, but you know, you're right. Continuity kind of matters here. And you know, it's it stinks that Fields is kind of like not off to a great start in that regard because you know his first year was you know the last year of you know, Nagy, and, you know, that was kind of a disaster near the end there. Um, just two, you know, coaching staff and a player that just aren't on the same, you know, trajectory in terms of where they need to be going for, where you have a coaching staff that's, you know, playing for their jobs and, you know, they're, they're not in a position to really develop a young quarterback because they don't have, you know, the time to, in, in order to develop that quarterback, whereas you have a quarterback in Justin Fields that, you know, needs the development. So it just didn't really mesh there. And then you go into this year, 
you have a brand new coaching staff. They hire a defensive minded head coach, and you know you're bringing in an offensive coordinator who you know, wants to run the ball a lot, basically. So, you know, I, I still have some questions about the coaching staff, obviously, but you know you hope that with better talent next year that we can kind of start to see you know what they have there from a coaching standpoint, and you know only time will tell on that standpoint. Uh, for me, from a team building standpoint, I look at two things here. One, uh, the Chiefs, you know, yeah, they traded away Tyreek Hill this offseason, but you look at what they did to kind of make up for the loss of, you know, one of the most dynamic weapons in the NFL. You can't replace, you know, a player like Tyreek Hill, um, you know, easily. Uh, that should be said. But the way they went about, you know, adding as many, you know, quality receiving options as possible to their roster. You know, it is a blueprint, I think, for teams like, yeah, even if you don't, again, they have a number one receiver in Travis Kelsey. Like, I get it, he plays tight end, but for all intents and purposes, he's a number one wide receiver in the NFL. Like, that, that that's the role that he plays in their offense. Um, you know, talent wise, like, he's just as good of a receiver as any of the number one receivers in the NFL. Like, Travis Kelsey's that, that dude. So they already have a number one wide receiver. How can you? Best maximize that. Well, get as many different quality options as possible. They already had guys like Mikel Hardman in the building already. Um, they bring in Marquez Valdez Scantling and Juju Smith Schuster in free agency. Uh, they draft, you know, Sky Moore in the second round of last year's draft. And then they also make a trade for Kadarius Tony, um, giving up a third round pick to the Giants for receiver. And it just goes to show that um, you know, one, in order to build out the weapons for your, you know, franchise quarterback. You need a number one wide receiver, which the Bears don't have right now. But number two, you got to keep taking uh, shots at adding talent to receiving core and getting guys with different skill sets that can fill different roles and contribute in different ways. You look at the way that this receiving core is kind of built by them. You know, Mark Quest felt his scanning was that deep threat for them, that guy that can take the top off of a defense and kind of, you know, spread things out vertically for them. Juju Smith Schuster was kind of that, you know, possession guy. A guy who can play in the slot, a guy that can block in the run game, um, you know, get the ball underneath, get tough yards after the catch, be a nice possession receiver on third downs and whatnot. You know, it's all built around Travis Kelsey as your number one option as a tight end. But then you have guys like McCole Hardman, who's kind of like a, you know, speedy gadget guy. You know, they go and get Sky Moore, who's kind of like a slot receiver as well. Um, and then, you know, obviously the trade for Canaris Tony, another gadget guy who can get make plays with the ball in his hands and stuff like that. So, all that to say that you know they had clearly an idea for the identity of how to build out their receiving core, and they aggressively attacked um, adding talent to that position, despite the fact that they gave up you know a premium player in Tyree Kill, and it just shows that the Bears, if they want to build out a receiving core around Justin Fields, they one need to identify you know one get a number one wide receiver in there for him at some point, but you know two identify you know the traits that are useful for building out your offense and three aggressively attack bringing in, you know, players that have those traits and components to your offense and build out a robust core of players to throw the ball to. I, I think that's kind of, you know, one of the main things there. My second main takeaway from the chiefs is you look at, you know, the defense side of the ball for the chiefs and yeah, they're not great on defense, but I think they're kind of the poster child for in the modern day NFL. You do not need a great defense anymore to win championships or to be consistently competitive for championships. What you can't have is a terrible defense. You can't be like where the bears were this year, where you're just giving up points left and right. And it's just embarrassing at some points, you know, ultimately on defense, like I think the chiefs were like in the middle of the pack for EPA per play. They were in the middle of the pack for, you know, defensive DVOA and other impact mass metrics, defensive metrics for the, for that side of the ball. It just goes to show that, I mean, obviously, yeah, it helps to have a homes and it's historically good offense, but, you know, offense is the main driver for winning teams in the NFL today. What you need to have on defense is, one, you just need to be good enough on that side of the ball to where you're not, you know, giving up points left and right like the Bears were this past year. You need star players at key positions. You need a star pass rusher. You need star um, coverage players um, to kind of, you know, be able to make big plays and big moments for you. Um and number three, you got to be aggressive on that side of the ball. You, know, you can't, you know, play passive on defense. You can't, you know, just be reactive. You got to be able to, you know, scheme up things and, you know, make things difficult for opposing offenses from a schematic standpoint to 
kind of challenge him a bit. And, you know, Steve Spagnuolo is one of the best defensive coordinators at doing that. So I, I think that was kind of the recipe for the Chiefs. Like, have this dynamic, dynamic offense and just be good enough on defense to where we have playmakers that in big spots can make big plays and, you know, get teams off the field, get turnovers, and, you know, make things happen on, on that side of the ball from that standpoint. But, you know, enough about the Chiefs. Let's look at the Eagles now and look at, you know, some of the things that the Bears can learn from them. So for the Eagles, you said, what are some things that the Bears can take away from how they built that roster? Well, really the big thing is this when it comes to the Eagles is how do you invest in the trenches year in and year out? If we're going to be honest, people may not want to hear this answer. There's such a negative connotation and Howard Roseman gets viewed in such a negative manner. But one of the things he's never really overlooked is continuing to invest in the trenches. You've got guys like Lane Johnson who have been in the league 10, 11, 12 years now. I mean, they've been phenomenal, right? Same thing with the center, Jason Kelsey. And same with guys like Andre Dillard as well. These multi-year vets that kind of started out a bit rough, but really have stabilized moving forward. You look at the defensive side of the ball. I mean, listen, Fletcher Cox is the heart and soul of that defense and of that defensive line. I believe he's the longest tenured Philadelphia Eagle on the roster right now. But they've got guys like Brandon Graham. Beyond that, they have guys like Hassan Reddick as well. You go out and you sign Nadamik and Sue halfway through the season, and then you have these players like Javon Hargrave. So really, if you want to build a mean, nasty football team that's going to dominate at the line of scrimmage every single play, you need to go ahead and you need to invest in the offensive as well as the defensive line. I mean, if we're going to be real, the Bears will get a young player on the offensive line every couple of years, and people will think, hey, that's the player we can build around. But then ultimately, the Bears never end up building around that player. And quite frankly, if you want to be honest, I mean, that guy this past season was Tevin Jenkins, the guy on the offensive line they could build around. Braxton Jones, I think the jury's still out on him a bit because you have a faction of Bears fans that say, well, Braxton Jones is a left tackle moving forward. And there's the other half that says, no, he's not the guy moving forward. But I think you have to find a middle ground with Braxton and say that he wasn't great this past season. Wasn't incredibly terrible either. He was just about there and really slightly above average. So ultimately, I mean, that's why this whole concept of investing in the trenches ties into the first overall pick because people are wondering, hey, are the Bears just going to surpass trading down in order to make sure they get that blue chip prospect in the trenches so that they can start building this thing out inside out? Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's one of the most noble things for High Roseman as a GM is the continuous investment on the offensive line play and defensive line play. Like, even when he does have really good units, he never stops investing on that side of, on, the, on those two key areas uh, of his team. So, the defensive line, I mean, for many years, like it seemed like every single year he was investing a first round pick on a defensive lineman or an offensive lineman. That's changed over the last few years as he you know, invest in more wide receiver because he started to value that position more and more over the last few years. But, you know, for a long time, it's always been, you know, Brandon Graham was a first round pick. I uh, look at some of the other guys on that roster. I think Fletcher Cox was a fr- first round pick. It was a long time ago, but, you know, a guy that, you know, he's been, the, you know, the key building block of that team for a long time. Javon Hargrave was a big free agent acquisition. You know, Jordan Davis uh, was a first round pick. Obviously, this past year for that team on the defensive line, uh, you know, Bennett was a first round pick for them. Didn't really play a huge role for them this year, but, you know, a guy that they invested a lot in. Uh, Josh Sweat, I think they took a chance in him in the third or fourth round, I think, um, when uh, they drafted him. And then Hassan Reddick, he was a big free agent acquisition for them uh, this past year. So, um, again, just I just named off like six guys, six, seven guys right there that the Eagles invested a lot of resources in to bring those guys in and have them be part of a deep rotation, not to mention like trading a fourth round pick for Robert Quinn. I know it didn't work out for them. It, it's going to end up being a bad trade in, in you know the long run, but it just goes to show that even when they have a lot of talent on that side, on that defensive line group, they never stop adding talent there because you can never have, you know, too many, too much depth on that defensive line. Because it's so important to, in order to get after quarterbacks, you've got to go after them in waves. And 
with multiple guys, not just a couple of guys here and there that can make plays. Like go after them in multiple guys in multiple ways um, and just create havoc up front. And then the offensive line, look at you know the investment on that side of the ball. Lane Johnson, first round pick right there. Uh, you know, their left tackle, he's getting paid a big, big contract there. Andre Dillard, who is backup for them, but he was a first round pick. Um, you look at at the center position, Jason Kelsey, um, you know, he's been one of the higher paid paid centers. He's one of the best centers in football, investing in him. And then in the second round this past year, they invest in his replacement. So getting that right there. Uh Landon Dickerson, a second round pick uh, at left guard. They, you know, they draft him there. Um, continuously getting guys on day three of the draft to come in and compete for spots as well. You know, free agent signings, acquisitions, trades, always looking to be active on also developing that offensive line as well. So, you know, investing on both sides of the ball in the trenches, I think that's going to be something that Ryan Bowles is going to have to do this offseason because that's where the Bears were weakest, I think, this past year. Offensive line wasn't very good in pass protection. Defensive line was maybe, I mean, by far the worst in football. So they got to fix that going into the offseason. And it's only going to be fixed by investing a lot uh, in those position groups. Uh, for me, in terms of my takeaway for the Eagles, uh, the way they built this roster, a couple things here, like, and I want to make them as quick as possible here. Um, but I think, you know, what they did to kind of build that roster around Jalen Hurts, and they've done this multiple times too, like Howie Roseman, the way he built around Carson Wentz, you know, going all in while he was on his rookie deal, doing the same thing with Jalen Hurts, you know. They were patient with him. They let him develop a little bit. They gave him that you know, year last year where, yeah, it, it wasn't pretty at times, but you know they were patient in, in letting him develop. And then this past year, they truly go all in. And you know, once they were confident that he was their guy, you know, they were they were willing to go all in and you know build that roster around him and try to get the most out of him while he was still on that cheap rookie contract. So that's kind of like the one takeaway I have from them. But also hedging their bets and having ways to pivot uh, when things don't go according to plan. And, and the biggest, you know, example of this is the Carson Wentz, Jalen Hurts situation where Carson Wentz, they give him the big contract. He struggles out of the gate, can't stay healthy. They go and draft Jalen Hurts in the second round when it was an unpopular pick at the time to do so. And then eventually trade Carson Wentz away and commit to Jalen Hurts. Um, so first they do that pivot there to get out of Carson Wentz deal and um, invest in the young quarterback and Jalen Hurts then. And then also while Jalen Hurts is being invested in and given the opportunity to start, they get an extra first round pick for Carson Wentz and they continue to trade four first round picks going into the future to hedge their bets even more and more in case Jalen Hurts doesn't work out. Now we have extra draft capital just in case we need, we need to maybe go up and get a quarterback in the next year's draft if he's the guy just – you know, always being forward thinking, always thinking ahead, always being ahead of, of the crowd, so to speak, and being, you know, 10 steps ahead of the rest of the league. I, I think that's where Howie Roseman was at his best over the last few years, kind of building this Eagles roster. And, you know, it took them some time. They had to kind of rework their roster a little bit after the Super Bowl um, and kind of reload a little bit on that group. There's a lot of core guys from that Super Bowl team that are still there. Um, but, you know, it, the way they constructed that roster was masterful. The way that Howie Roseman just won, it seemed, seemed to win every trade, make all the smart signings, manage the cap effectively, and just do a dang good job of building a great roster. So, um, looking forward here to this offseason, uh, you know, how this relates to the Bears, you know, the connections are there for the Bears with both teams here. And obviously, they can learn a lot from both teams because, you know, Ryan Poles coming from the Kansas City Chiefs, you know, he was in that organization practically since he first got his start as an executive in the NFL. So, you know, he knows the ins and outs of that organization, and how they built that team. And then you look at Ian Cunningham, the assistant GM, you know, his last stop was in Philadelphia as well as the assistant GM over there. So, two guys that, you know, have a lot of experience in both buildings and, Going into this offseason, there's a lot of connections in terms of players from both teams that um, could be targets for the Bears this offseason. So, uh, you know, you say when you look at, you know, team, uh, the guys that are going to be free agents for both teams with the Chiefs and the Eagles here, um, you know, who are some of the names that you think the Bears could be interested in uh, to kind of add to this roster and, you know, maybe try to get some of that Chiefs and Eagles magic onto this Bears squad? 
you know, that's when you and I were putting this together, it's a phenomenal talking point because familiarity is the name of the game in the NFL. And I mean, if, if I'm the Eagles, the one guy I'm not going to let hit the open market is TJ Edwards. If I'm the bears, I'm looking at TJ Edwards, Chicago area native. And I'm saying he's a linebacker. I need to be all over because if you watch that game on Sunday afternoon and Sunday evening, nobody popped off the screen as much as TJ Edwards did for that Eagles defense. I mean, he's quietly been so underrated. He was all over the field, consistently making plays outside of getting burnt once or twice. So he's a really smart guy. Now for the chiefs, I mean, it's tough. I'm sorry for the, the, yeah, so for the Chiefs, it's a bit tough because Orlando Brown Jr. is the biggest name that comes to mind. But then again, I think when you look at a player like Orlando Brown Jr., he was incredibly inconsistent this past year. But we could just go ahead and say that a um, change of scenery is something that could really benefit him. I mean, the Chiefs are tough because they typically don't have a lot of players who end up hitting free agency. But, you know, you have Orlando Brown, who's the number one guy. Then you've got Juju Smith-Schuster, who was on a one-year deal this past year. He could be a player to go ahead and target. You know, Andrew Wiley's a veteran right tackle. He's a name that's been really solid this past season. He's a former undrafted free agent who just made a name for himself. And then you go ahead and you look at a guy such as a... Juan Thornhill, for example, you know, that's a player that if you were to bring Juan Thornhill in, he'd start for you. You don't necessarily need a safety, but we don't know what's going to happen with a player like an Eddie Jackson, for example. And then I think, you know, in terms of some depth too, right, there is Prince Tango Wanago, a player that I really liked coming out of the draft. He's a guy that I would like to see in a Bears uniform just to get that additional depth um, created. And then last name for me, right, I think is interior defensive lineman Kalen Saunders. He's a third or fourth round pick of the Chiefs from two or three years ago. Local Chicago area player too. So, because he played football at Eastern Illinois. But he's a name that if the Chiefs have to make some roster cuts and includes getting rid of defensive linemen, Kalen Saunders is a guy I would be enamored with. You know, you bring up T.J. Edwards. Funny story here. You talk about him being a local kid. Uh, T.J. Edwards went to high school, uh, Lakes Lakes High School um, in Lake Villa, Illinois. That is about when I lived – that was about 10 minutes away from where I lived um, in high school. So we were actually – my high school I went to, we were like school kind of rivals with – uh, the high school that TJ Edwards went to. I think he was still going to high school when I was in high school as well. So it's kind of cool. It'll be really cool. Um, talk about him being the hometown kid. Like I know a lot of guys that um, know TJ Edwards personally, and um, that'd be a really cool situation if he was able to come to the Bears here, be that local kid, and um, yeah, that that would be really exciting, especially growing up in the area um, around where. I'm at there. That would be that would get a lot of people that I know very excited for sure if he were to come here and be a Chicago Bear. But I, I look at the Eagles roster. Um, you know, I, I <laughs> there's a lot of talent that I want from the Eagles roster. For, you know, first of all, because um, again, it's one of the more talented rosters in the NFL. They have some key guys. You know, going to be free agents. Uh, the big name for me is always going to be Javon Hargrave because I think if you want that three tech that Eagles clearly wants, you know, for this defense, like Javon Hargrave fits the bill for what he wants in the three tech. He's disruptive. He's a, you know, elite pass rusher in the interior. Um, he's quick off the ball. He's versatile. He can defend the run a little bit. Um, he's the full package from, um, you know, being that three tech disruptive force in the middle of this defensive line. The only, you know, maybe hang back the bears may have is that he's going to be 30 years old next year. So are they willing to invest big money and a guy who's getting a little bit up there in age, but you know, we've seen interior defensive linemen, you know, age gracefully in the past year. And there's nothing to suggest that Hargrave isn't going to be, you know, that type of guy moving forward here. You know, he had a great playoff run. He's coming off one of his better seasons of his career. He's been consistent year in and year out um, from a production standpoint. Um, I, I think he's like a no brainer because I think he's going to be, you know, the top defensive lineman on the market. I think he's a no brainer to bring in. Um, and 
he set the tone right away for the defensive line and be a guy that teams have to account for on a weekly basis in the interior of the defensive line there. So he, he's the top guy on my list. Um, I think Miles Sanders is going to be an intriguing option at running back. I think the Bears are going to look to try to upgrade that position because Dave Montgomery, like you know, great locker room guy, very tough dude, um, have a hell of a lot of respect for what he did for the Bears over the last four years, but he's a guy that you can easily upgrade both in the draft and in free agency. Miles Sanders, I think, you know, he's not a significant upgrade, but he's more explosive. I think he offers more um, in terms of the big playability. Um, he's a three down back in terms of b- the ability to, you know, catch the ball out of the backfield. So I-, I think he'd be a guy that they would be very interested in. And I would like to see them, you know, take a chance on Andre Dillard just to see what he has. You know, first round pick, you know, talented pass protector. Didn't really put put it all together with Philadelphia. So, you know, bring him in, see if he can compete with Braxton Jones, who, yeah, I think he's a building block moving forward potentially, but give him, give him some, uh, some competition at left tackle and see, you know, how he responds to that. And, you know, if, if Andre Naylor doesn't earn a starting spot, I think he can be a pretty solid uh, swing tackle for you as well. It'll be an upgrade over Larry Borm in that role. Um, and then for the chiefs, You know, like you said, there's not as much talent hitting free agency this year as the Eagles, I think, for them. You know, Orlando Brown's going to be the big name, but I'm not sure if he's a fit with uh, the Bears just from a scheme standpoint and the fact that I think they don't want to spend big money after, you know, Braxton Jones is looking like he's going to work out for them. You want to bring competition for Braxton Jones. I'm not sure if you want to go and outright replace him with a big money free agent. And again, I don't, I don't think Brown's a scheme fit because he's just not a very good athlete. And I think polls has made it a point of emphasis that he wants to get lighter and more athletic on that offensive line, to kind of fit that outside zone system that they want to run. Um, but some other names that in, intrigue me, like you mentioned, Kalen Sanders, Saunders um, as a kind of rotational run defender in the interior, I think intrigues me a little bit um, to kind of fill that one tech role. Um, you know, McCole Harmon's a name that kind of bring up as a wide receiver gadget guy. Um, you know, it could be some, someone that they try to bring in as well. Um, and then Andrew Wiley, I could definitely see uh, – Poles taking a chance on as well because Wiley kind of fits the athletic, you know, frame that they want. You know, he's not the prototypical tackle uh, in terms of his size and length, but you know, he's quick off the ball. He's a pretty good run blocker. You need to help him out in pass protection, though. Like, that's the one thing that's going to be an issue with Andrew Wiley throughout, you know, his career is that uh, again, he's not a guy that is going to be a long term starter for you. But if you want to bring him in as like a stopgap option, if you can't get one of the top right tackles in the market. You know, he's definitely a guy that can be serviceable for you on a, on a pretty cheap deal. So I think those are some guys that the, you know, the Bears can look out for. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, free agency is about a month away. Um, it's kind of crazy to think that's that's the case, but we're about a month away from free agency. So I think a lot of those guys are going to be in the mix here for the Bears. And, you know, those connections for Poles and Cunningham, I think, are going to come up huge. Like, like you said, you say, like, the NFL is all about connections and, you know, who you are familiar with. And, um, you know, the Bears are certainly going to be familiar with a lot of these guys that are going to be hitting the market in the upcoming 2023 offseason. Um, so with that said, to end this podcast here today, uh, let's take a look back at the 2022 season as a whole, because I think there's a lot to learn from this past year in terms of the team building strategies and some of the trends that are, you know, going forward for the NFL. So when you look at the trends for team building, you said, you know, what are some of the things that we can take away from 2022 and, and kind of use it to build off of for 2023? Well, I think the first thing is this is secondary is a new pass rush in the NFL. No discredit to teams that don't have a very good pass rush or teams that have a great pass rush. But ultimately, at the end of the day, like you're seeing more and more the leagues becoming such a passing offense. You need to have five really good defensive backs to be able to even begin to counter a lot of these high flying offenses. And that's two really good corners on the boundary, a good slot corner inside, and then a good strong safety as well as a freed safety. You also look at the way some of these defensive backs are being used. Teams are certainly more and more comfortable with having their 
strong safeties up near the line of scrimmage to go ahead and blitz. I mean, before when we talked about blitzing, it was almost always linebackers that were doing it. Now it's crazy because the Bears did it with Jaquan Brisker this past year, right? They had him up near the line of scrimmage multiple times. The other big trend that we're seeing take place is that the wide receiver position has become so valued now. It's not just about having that A.J. Brown or that Justin Jefferson on your team. More so, it's about do you have that A.J. Brown and Justin Jefferson, and then do you have a legitimate number two, and I say in quotes because a guy like Devontae Smith or Adam Thielen would be a number one on most other teams around the NFL. So this just continued investment in these receivers is something that's going to be a big trend over the next five, six, seven years. The last thing I want to emphasize is this, is that this past season with the way some teams like the chiefs and the dolphins operated, they realized that considering their situation and circumstances of where they're at, it's almost better to go ahead and trade the two first round picks for a guy like Bradley Chubb to kind of get you in win now mode. Whereas the chiefs also taught us that it is better to go ahead and take a flyer on a failed first round pick like a Kadarius Tony, because if you have the right infrastructure in place, you can turn any player's career around. You know, I think uh, what you touched on at the last point is intriguing there. Like, the dichotomy between the Miami Dolphins going all in and, you know, giving up draft picks and spending a bunch of money and kicking money into the future to build their roster around Tua, whereas the Chiefs kind of took a step back and, you know, kind of retooled the roster or rebuilt the roster, so to speak, in the offseason and, you know, made an effort to get younger um, and get more draft picks and kind of, you know, fix their salary cap situation a little bit. You know, there are a lot of teams right now that are kind of, you know, doing one or two things. There, there are teams that are either going on the all-in approach of, you know, spending all of our draft picks and kicking money into the future and being aggressive to win now. And then there are teams that are taking a long-term view at this and, you know, understanding that draft capital is, you know, a very, very good to have. Um, and having salary cap flexibility is a very important thing to have as well. And ultimately, look at the team that, you know, the t- two teams that had the mindset of having, you know, more flexibility from a draft capital standpoint and more flexibility from a you know salary cap standpoint. Although the Eagles are kind of they're they're, they're a weird team with how they manage the cap. I, I will see that, but um, you know, those are the two teams that ended up in the Super Bowl, though. You know, the two teams that didn't go all in, and the two teams that were smart about building up draft picks and. Um, understanding the value of having players on rookie contracts, um, especially building up at key valuable positions on those rookie contracts. I mean, the, the Chiefs spending a first-round picks on a cornerback in this past year's draft and an edge rusher, getting a wide receiver in the second round, um, you know, getting key players on that, on that offensive line and rookie contracts, like all so valuable to have. And, you know, I, I find it interesting – that you, you compare that to teams like the Dolphins who are trading all their draft picks away for veteran players to come in and contribute right away and how that really didn't work out for them in the end. And then the 49ers trading all those draft picks for Christian McCaffrey. And yeah, it worked out for them um, from a standpoint of, you know, they got to the NFC championship game, um, you know, but at some point, you know, that's going to come back to bite them in the future when they don't have the resources to kind of, you know, maintain that roster and reload at certain positions. Like at some point, they're going to have to pay uh, the price for that at some point. So I find it interesting, you know, how teams went about that differently. But, you know, with the 49ers, I think, you know, they kind of show one of the other trends I think the Bears need to follow, which is loading up on weapons with however you can. You know, the way they built that receiving room with, you know, Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle, you know, bringing in Christian McCaffrey, drafting guys um, in the draft as well, bringing in more, you know, options. Like, I think, you know, one of the things that we're going to see moving forward here is that it's going to be a continuous arms race for getting talented receivers into the building because those guys are truly game changers. If you can get a true game changer at wide receiver, that does a ton for your franchise quarterback. It does a ton for your offense and making them more efficient. And that's going to be the trend. That I think it's going to be, you know, in place moving forward here is that teams are going to be more willing to spend, you know, high quality resources on bringing in number one wide receivers and playmakers and offense, because those guys, you know, 
change games. And I think that's going to be, you know, the Bears, they're going to be in that conversation this year, I think, for, you know, trading for one of these guys, whether it's T. Higgins or Brandon Ayuk or DeAndre Hopkins. Like, they're going to be in the discussion for bringing in one of those guys. And it's a smart thing to do because, you know, it helps your young quarterback. It helps your offense, and it's just another way to add more explosiveness to uh, your passing game, which is how you win the NFL today is building out, you know, the passing game aspect of things. If you're not building your team to, you know, have an explosive passing game or efficient passing game and be able to defend against good passing games, you know, you're not going to win in the NFL today. And I think that's kind of the other main um, thing to take away from 2022 is that, you know, how you build your roster matters here. You got to build your roster to uh, defend the pass and be efficient, efficient in the pass. And, you know, having a strong run game is nice, but at the end of the day, if you can't throw the ball effectively um, and if you can't defend the pass effectively, you're not going to go far uh, when it comes to competing for championships. And I think that's what the bears are trying to do here not just being mediocre, not just being so competitive uh, competing for championships. And I think it's ultimately some of the things that they can kind of look forward to doing uh, moving forward here as they look to rebuild this roster um, with all the assets that they have this off season. So without further ado, that's going to wrap it up for us here at the Picks for Polls podcast. A lot of big picture stuff for us today, um, but it's all goes to show that this is a very fun season. Um, and I can't wait now that we're going to be officially all in on uh, draft mode. So a lot coming up here for uh, draft coverage uh, with a lot of prospect interviews coming up. And um, we're going to be getting into our position previews for this upcoming draft moving forward. So looking forward to all that stuff uh, coming up ahead. Um, but before we do, before we close out things today, you know, make sure to like, rate, subscribe to us on all podcasting platforms uh, at the Blue Wire um, and then, of course, make sure to follow us on social media as well. You can follow us on Twitter at Pixar Polls and get all of our updates there throughout uh, the course of this offseason, this draft cycle. Uh, you say it for you. Where can our listeners find you on social media and where can they find your work? Yeah, you guys can follow me on social media at Usaid Koshu. You can also check out my work on the Bear Report website. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure to give you say a follow there. As for me, you can follow me on Twitter at AJ Freeman 25. You can find my work on the bear report as well. Uh, I have a big project coming up in the works here with um, a mock off season. You know, I'm very excited to put that together. I've been thinking a lot about how I would build the bears if I was a GM for this off season. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun going through that over the next few weeks or so. Once I get that ready to up and rolling. So uh, for us here at picture polls, uh, have a have you guys uh, a great weekend coming up here. Stay safe, everybody, and we'll be looking forward to seeing you guys next week to talk more draft content coming going into the future for uh, this draft cycle. Bear down.